thinking of uh, any questions you might have, let me say that, that this teaching and the teaching about the centrality of, of law in God's kingdom, why it's important to really have a, a love for God's rulership, uh, is in this my most recent book, the orange one called Culture of the Kingdom. So I'm, I offer, offer that to you because I don't think we're going to be able to answer all the questions. Now. Okay, who's got a question? Thanks for the lesson, it's really okay, sure. amazing. Um, the question that I have was uh, regarding just now when you were explaining about how people have been praying for you, but you didn't receive any impartation of any sort. So um, if, if it would be possible for you to explain more, um, I'd like to understand this because from what I know, um, this impart uh, what I know is that the impartation can be passed down from a teacher to a student, like um, Elijah to Elisha, and people who we sit under, who maybe have a business calling in, let's say, the area of finances, and if we are trained better, then we can operate fully in what God has called us to do. I, I believe strongly in teachers and mentors, and uh, but it won't help you if God's called you in, in one area to be mentored in another. Right? You need to find teachers and mentors who can who can either help you find your calling or once you have found it to mentor you in that calling. All right, I, I believe every single human being is designed for something special. You know, God is so creative and so able to make everything different from another. Every blade of grass is different from the next one. Every leaf on every tree that ever was and ever will be is different from the next. Every wave on the sea is different from the next. God is so creative, He never has to do the same thing twice. When it comes to human beings, the crown of His creation, the only part of His creation that He says, that's in my image. Okay? Why should we think that any human being is like another? And, there were, and we're not. Every human being, specially designed by God, specially created and purposefully designed for, for, God's, for God's reason. All right, now, our problem in finding that reason is that when we're born, two people become very important in our life, mother and dad, right? And they may not be believers, and even if they are believers, what they end up doing is putting on you their expectations, their hopes, their dreams, their unfinished business, okay, one, one way or the other. Okay, and, it, and most when you have godly parents who are praying, that's, that's, a, that, that's a big help. Okay, a really big help. But all parents end up putting some baggage, if not a lot of baggage, on, on people. And then if you survive that process, you get to go to school. <laughs> right? And at school, your teachers and your friends take over. Right? And they tell you, Okay? What it means to be successful and popular, what you have to be, which, how you have to act, how you have to talk, how you have to dress. Okay? And if you survive that, then you get to go out into the workforce and your company takes over. And your company tells you what it, what it means to be successful and how you, okay, and so on it goes. And so modern society is filled with thousands and thousands of adults who've learned to adapt to the expectations and internalize the expectations of many, many other people but they may have no idea who they are really. Okay, then that adult comes into the kingdom of God. So in order to get to God's expectation and really live it, most of us have to strip away so much falsehood, okay, that has been layered onto us. It's a process. You don't come to this right away. Young people like yourself actually have an advantage because you, you don't have so much of that on you already. Right? And, and the Bible is, is so full of many examples how God used young people. Okay, Jeremiah was probably a teenager when God called. It's, it's, it's better to get God's call when you're young. Right? But, nevertheless, every single one of us will find we have to put away our own ambition, our own desire, and bring ourselves to the Lord and say, whatever you say. Getting to that place, and I, I sometimes say to young people, you've got to get to the place where you can pray a one-word prayer, and that 
one word is whatever. <laughs> okay, now listen, it's not whatever. Right? <laughs> it's, it's whatever. <laughs> and it's a, it's a struggle to get to that place of freedom where you can honestly wake up in the morning and say to your king, your creator, your God, whatever. What, this day is your day. This is the day that you've made for me. I'm the person you made. Whatever you want from me today, you tell me, that's what I do. Some of you know, indeed, what a struggle it is to get to that place. For years, you know, when I, when I was younger, you know, I, had, I, was a, I was a husband, I was a father, I had a corporate job, I had a paycheck, I had a retirement plan, I, I needed income. I didn't think that I could go to God and say whatever. Because no matter what he said, I'd still have to go to work. <laughs> now that I'm older, I realize that was an illusion. That was an illusion. He was always providing for me. He was always providing for me. And he would have provided for me in any way that he chose. I could have much younger come to that place and really honestly said to him, whatever you say. And when you get to that place of freedom, first of all, two things happen. At least two things happen. One is joy comes. Joy is not happiness. Happiness, you buy a new car, you know, someone loves you, you're happy. All right? There's a reason for it. Joy, there's no reason for it. <laughs> joy is a spirit. It comes on you. Okay? It's wild. Okay? It's untamed. All right? Joy is God's gift. When you start getting close to that whatever, there will be seasons when the joy of the Lord will come on you and you, you, you go quietly wild, all right? <laughs> and that joy becomes your strength. It invigorates you. you. You say, in those in that joy, you say, I can do anything that God says. I can speak to this mountain and cause it to move away out of my I mean, you have, it's, it's that empowerment, and that, and, and I believe, but getting to that place of that kind of freedom, it's a process. But once you set your heart on it, and you ask God, this is what I want. I want to get to that place so I can be free to serve you. He'll bring you. All right, but don't expect it to happen overnight, and don't expect it to happen without a cost. You may not realize how much you want something else until God says, well, you know, you're just going to have to if you want what I've got, you're going to have to lay that down. And then you, then you realize, whoa, this is not an easy thing. But when we get to that place, the simplicity comes back into our life, the fruitfulness comes, and we start realizing He's already smiling. I'm, I'm in the smile of the Lord. I'm walking towards that smile. And you know, that makes all the difference in All right, who's got another question? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> um, Peter, you've mentioned that um, there are different time and seasons where you're caught to different places. Is it possible that um, God can take away an anointing or a gift and to enter a different season? Yes. Yes, you have you have different different seasons, but I believe in every person there is a theme. All right, so like and and the Bible. This is why the Bible is so fascinating, and why the Bible was designed the way it was designed by God. It has the stories of people who lived through different seasons of their life. But I think what we what we see in in most of the people in the Bible is that there is there is a, a theme in their life and a particular gift. There are people with multiple gifts. And among us, okay? But even when you have more than one gift, there's always going to be one that is predominant. Okay? So you look at the seasons in Joseph's life, and you see this administration just comes out. Okay? Hits you in the face, all right? Um, King David, okay? He was gifted as a musician. He was a prophet of the Lord. He was king. He was a father. He was a husband. But 
primary gift that he always had that was his strongest gift, he was a warrior. He was the most gifted warrior that Israel ever had. Okay, and he got into trouble with Bathsheba, remember? When, uh, when he refused to go out and fight. Um, the, the season came when the kings go out to do war and he thought, you know, I've, I've done it all, I'm gonna stay home. That's when he fell into trouble because that was his primary gift. He sh should have been out there beating back the enemies of, of Israel. Okay? He, was, he was a warrior. And I think this is true in everybody's life. There is a particular thread in the theme. It might take you through different environments, take you through the wilderness, take you, you know, this way and that way. Okay, but there is that theme that they will come back to. And um, I, I believe that, that God is very purposeful and He doesn't make it that complicated for us. When He says, when he says the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, He means I've chosen something for you. Okay. It's not so far away, it's not so difficult that you can't do this. It's within your grasp if you choose. And I'm never going to change my mind. But that doesn't mean that we won't have seasons in our life. We will definitely have different seasons in our life. Okay, hope that helps. There's a woman back there. Hi, my question is um, when we have a gifting and we are using it, um, does that necessarily mean that we are then exercising it in God's kingdom? Because we, what I think what we observe is that there are very successful Christian, say Christian doctors, Christian, making a lot of money, uh, Christian lawyers, Christian teachers, and working very hard. Not, not necessarily always work, making a lot of money, but they may be um, very good teachers who are very well liked and popular, but does that always mean that they are then advancing the kingdom of God? Because we get so, sometimes when we enjoy doing something, we get so sucked into it. But we don't really know whether this means, you know, we are then moving in God's kingdom and or advancing it. That's right. God, God will not change His mind about your gifting and calling. And you can use it for Him, or you can use it for yourself. You know, it still it still works. Unbelievers find their gift. You know, <laughs> almost by accident. You know, and and uh, that's why sports is, is so fascinating to watch. Because uh, the, the system of competitive sports, professional sports, is, is set up so that only the very gifted can rise to the top. And you can watch these people who are, who are I mean, this is what they're made to do. You know? They do things that the rest of us can't do, and we, 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 we enjoy watching that. And they may not be doing it for the Lord. Okay, so, the, so the gift can be used for all kinds of, all kinds of things. But I believe there's a, there's a specific purpose in advancing God's kingdom. There's, a, there's an anointing that goes on that gift when it's dedicated to the Lord. You know, for many years, uh, as, a, as a Christian, in fact, I got into this when I was studying in seminary, I worked in the computer industry. And I did a number of different technical jobs, and I worked for, a, for a, a different, different companies. But I ended up in marketing and in sales. And, uh, you know, I used to travel the world selling technology. And uh, I'd, I'd fly into cities and we'd have seminars. And, and basically, I would teach them. And because I had a gift of teaching, they would understand the technology. And because they understood the technology, they trusted me and they would buy from me. I was successful. But it, it occurred to me, and because at the same time I was also pastoring and I was also moving in ministry, I realized that I was, it was the same gift. Okay, I was just, it was just different, different audiences and, and, different, uh, and different terminology. And I realized that, that as I progressed in both of those worlds, that, that it could be yet even more focused. And so I, I would go back to God and say, okay, so I have this gift of teaching. How can it be even more effectively used? Okay, because I want you to be really happy on the day when my life is over. Okay, not just, you know, you, know, you were okay, you know, I watched your stuff. And it's, you know, not bad. <laughs> I'd really like him to say, that was good. <laughs> that was good. And so, so over the years, you know, I became more focused on how can this gift be best used, all right? And of course, there was the whole thing about income, you know, and where is the income going to come from? But you know, where God, where God sends you and you use His gift, it's literally true. He says, seek first my kingdom. If you put my kingdom first, everything else that you need, I'll give you. Okay. 
I hope, I hope that helps. All right. Every human being is gifted. I mean, the, the tragedy of humanity is how much is wasted. How many lives never even get to the point where they realize God is even calling them? I mean, war and famine, disease wipes out whole populations before they even have a chance to do anything. Think of all the waste. And then think how special you are. It's really important that the people of God, every single believer, really gets this and goes out to do it. If this begins to happen, we change the world. And in the process, Christianity as a movement surges forward again. All right. We break out of our religious captivity and we start to... And you know, in the process, we're going to have a lot of fun too. All right. I mean, there's a lot of joy that has not been released in the kingdom of God. Okay? because we haven't gone out in the areas where it's going to be found in our lives. Okay, I hope that answers you. Let's do it back to you. Okay, we'll, we'll be taking the last two questions. Sorry, um, I have a question, I guess, on what I, I guess what I'm hearing so a lot of is about doing something to God, and in a sense, it seems like there's a lot of focus on effort. And in a sense, I guess I was previously thought about this part about what can I do personally and what would Jesus do as of things. And in a sense, looking back at Ephesians, the realization that actually that doesn't bring me anywhere. If anything, it kind of makes me create my own God, thinking I how I can please Him. Um, so where perhaps does it come in where we just rest in God, where we can actually kind of in a way, allow the gospel to speak to the new man and not so much have the old man continue to focus on what we can do and perhaps really run off track. Because in a sense, we always, I mean, if we look at Genesis 6, in a sense, we always consider about how the thoughts of man, of the old man, in a way, always tie towards wickedness, towards evil. And how do we then not realize that what we are striving for or what we want to achieve is actually not in towards using the old man and doing the wrong things. Thank you. Well, that's why, that's why it's important to, to lay down our own ambitions and our own drives and really come to the place where we can receive from God. And yes, it is important. We enter God's rest by faith, by trusting in Him. That He's going to do it in our lives and He's going to protect us and we're going to, we're going to take care of us. But it's also an error to believe that all you have to do as a Christian is believe. Okay, in a way we've focused so much on faith that we've forgotten what is written in our Bibles. Faith without works is dead. Faith without the right action will not save you, according to the book of James. If you read the words of Jesus, particularly in the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example, the young religious lawyer comes to him and says, what do I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what, is the, what are the commandments? Love God with all your heart and soul and all your strength and love your neighbors yourself. And then he says to this young lawyer, do this and you will live. And the young lawyer says, okay, so define for me who is my neighbor. And Jesus tells him the parable of the Good Samaritan. And he deliberately chooses a Samaritan because the Samaritan has the wrong beliefs. Jesus doesn't agree with Samaritan beliefs. He corrected the woman at the well. Right? He says, you don't know what you're worshipping. We Jews know what we worship. Okay? Salvation is of the Jews. But in the story of the Good Samaritan, he deliberately chooses the Samaritan who has the wrong theology. But the Samaritan does the right thing. The people with the right beliefs leave the man lying beside the road. The Samaritan who has the wrong theology, he immediately goes to the man, has compassion on him and helps him. And then Jesus turns back to the lawyer and says, okay, so which of the three fulfilled the commandment of the Lord? And the answer is obvious. And so then Jesus again says to this young man, go and do the same. He, doesn't say to the, he didn't say to the young guy, go and believe what the Samaritan believes. He doesn't want him to believe what the Samaritan believes. He says, go and do what he did and you will find eternal life. 
Again, in Matthew chapter 25, parable of the ten virgins, parable of the talents, the three servants, the parable of the sheep and goats. In all of the examples of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 25, they all believe the same thing. All of the ten virgins believe that the bridegroom is going to come. They all want the bridegroom to come. They all want to be there with their lamps lit. They all believe that if they're there with their lamps lit, they're going to go into the wedding supper. It's clearly a, a, a teaching about judgment and eternal reward. They all believe, all of the ten virgins believe the same thing. But five get to go in and five don't. What's the difference between the five who go in and the five who don't? They did something different. They acted differently. They made different decisions. What we do in life is vitally important to God. Parable of the, of the talents, that's where we get the phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. All three servants believe the same thing. They all believe that they're accountable to the master. They all want to have a good report at the end. They all want to be rewarded by the master at the end. Two of them are rewarded, and one of them, according to Jesus, is thrown into outer darkness. Okay. What's the difference between the three, the three servants in his, in his teaching? They all believe the same thing. But two of them did something different with what God had given. So it's vitally important what we do, because we want to hear him say, well done. Believing gets you into the kingdom. You can't enter the kingdom unless you believe the right things. You can't even approach God unless you have the right beliefs. Belief is vital. It's, it's primary. But after you believe, if you don't do the right thing, you're not getting it either. This is the whole gospel, friends. And that's why marketplace people, of all people, should understand. Okay? Being in God's kingdom is about results. Listen, this was God's complaint with Israel. Remember Jesus walked across the Mount of Olives and he sees the, the, the fig tree and he cursed it? What was the problem with the fig tree? No fruit. Perfectly good fig tree, no fruit. And obviously it's a picture of judgment coming on Israel. He's saying, he was saying, Jesus was saying to the Israel of his day, you believe the right things. You've had the Bible for a thousand years. But you're not doing the right things. And I think we in the church are like that today. We have lots of good theology, tremendous teaching. At the click of a mouse, we can get a library of Christian works and the fruit of 2,000 years of Christian teaching. But the question is, what are we doing with it? Okay, and basically what I'm saying is that by, just simply by gathering together in our church organizations will not change the world. We've got to be equipped, we've got to be sent, and we've got to go. And not just some of us, we all have to go out. In our callings, in our gifting. And when we do this, the whole picture begins to change. Okay, so I'm not saying that we need to be driven or ambition-fueled, you know, and uh, like the world. You have to, if you want to do what God wants you to do, you have to learn how to rest. It's part of, part of His commandment. That's a good word for me. <laughs> I mean, if you don't rest, you're not going to be able to effectively continue to do what God wants you to do. But the whole purpose of rest is so that you can be more effective in doing what He wants you to do. So faith and works are part of the same truth. You can't have one without the other. Yes, ma'am. Last question. Sorry, I just want to ask, how would you place the fivefold ministry as a spiritual calling, or can it be defined in the marketplace, or is it only for church? Oh, you know, that's a really good question, okay, and so I'm thinking, you know, while I'm, while I'm answering. I think the fivefold ministry, as, as, as we just read from, from Ephesians chapter 4, okay, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, and evangelists, I think... That, that specifically about religious ministry callings. All right, and so, you know, I, th I think it's, it's, it's referring to people who work in the religious part of God's kingdom specifically. 
But I believe that there are people who are called outside of that religious part of, of God's body who have gifts that are similar. Okay, like a man or a woman may be gifted as an entrepreneur. Okay, the type of person that likes to start enterprises, but then wants to hand the management over to someone else and move on and start something else. That, there are people, of course, that are gifted like that. Okay? And some people may say, well, that's an apostolic gift because that's what apostles do. Okay? They come, they teach, they instruct, they start, and then they move on. Okay? You can call that apostolic, but I think it kind of confuses the issue. Uh, because I don't think you need to call people in the marketplace, marketplace apostles. You know, to me, it, it, it's not necessary. Okay, because, because people, every person has, has their own dynamic gift. And it's obvious that some people are going to be very gifted and very successful in the marketplace in their particular gift. You don't need to call the person an apostle. That, that person's fruit, that the person's works demonstrate, you know, really what they are. You know, because if you call a marketplace person an apostle, basically, I think there's an underlying message that you're spiritualizing, or you're, you're, the only way you can understand that person's gift is in a religious way. And I, I think that marketplace gifts stand on their own. Okay, so we can have apostles and prophets and pastors and evangelists who, who serve in the religious sector of society, and then you can have people with all kinds of gifts in the marketplace, and you don't need to confuse the two. Okay. I'm not saying it's wrong to say, oh, that person is a marketplace evangelist. Or, you know, there's a Japanese American who was called an evangelist for Apple. Okay, <laughs> it had nothing to do with the gospel, but he went out, you know, you know, evangelizing. I thought, okay, that's cute, but. Maybe not as necessary. Okay, thank you very much. It's really been fun to be with you.